In the past, I've shared stories with you about my family and my two brothers, Pat and Mike, but there's another member of our family that I've yet to share with you. Um, he is our adopted brother, if you will. His name is John Vier. Uh, he came to this country um, from Rwanda. Um, he suffered a lot during the genocides that took place there and lived several years in a refuge, refugee camp before um, Catholic charities were able to help him come to this country um, and have a new life. Before the genocides took place in Rwanda, John Vier had a very normal, uh, normal life. Um, he was surrounded by family and friends. Uh, he even taught uh, in the Catholic school teaching religion to uh, third grade age uh, kids. Um, and then when the genocides came, um, his whole life was taken from him. The evils that he experienced and the evils that he saw uh, are unimaginable. Witnessing uh, his family members being killed in front of him. Um, and he's left with nothing. Uh, only to go to a refugee camp and who knows what else evil he experienced while living in, in that place. And he comes to the United States with absolutely nothing, knowing no one. Um, and he's put into a place in the city of Indianapolis. Um, the Catholic Charities, um, um, that's, you know, our donations to Catholic Charities make something like this possible. And so he comes to this new place, not really speaking the language, um, uh, not knowing and understanding things, and having to start all over again. Um, and so out of the blue one day, uh, the parish priest uh, called my parents and asked if they would take him to church on Sunday because they lived right near uh, his, his apartment complex. And they said yes, and little did they know by saying yes what uh, would end up happening. As they would take him to church, uh, they, would, they would talk to him and they would learn about his story. And a friendship started to develop. Uh, next thing you know, my dad is teaching him how to drive, which he said was not uh, an easy task. <laughs> Um, he's helping him with his taxes. Uh, they're helping him with just normal everyday things that we may not think about that he has to adjust to and, 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 and be able to do on his, on his own. Somewhere along the line, and I don't know when it happened, but somewhere along the line, um, he actually adopted my parents. He started calling my mom, mom, my dad, dad. Uh, my mom would have, uh, you know, had these mom conversations. She could tell something was bothering him and she would ask him, are you missing your parents? And he would say yes, and they would have these conversations about that. Uh, John VA um, has, has worked in the medical field and he's, he's, go, he's uh, gone to classes and, and to progress uh, his, his job. At one time he worked in the hospice at St. Vincent's. My aunt, uh, my mom's sister, um, was dying of cancer there. And my mom and her sisters were in the room gathered around uh, my aunt and John VA walks in and she says she, she and her sisters were so amazed at the tenderness in which he acted in caring uh, for this, uh, for my aunt. Now he knew that they were, uh, who this was, but my mom was thinking he does this for everyone. Uh, she um, would watch him, he ushers at mass over at St. Pius and, and she says, just watch him walk someone down the aisle uh, to, to their seat. There's a tenderness in which he moves, and it's genuine and it's authentic. The reason I bring this up is that, um, you know, when you think about it, when I think about it anyways, I look at John VA and I'm amazed um, and inspired because he has every reason in the world to be filled with anger and hatred whether it's at God or whether it's at other human beings because of what's been taken from him. But he chose not to allow that to consume him. He chose to respond to others as the way Christ responded to those who were hurting him as he hung on the cross. That's the thing about evil. Evil, not only does it bring pain and suffering into our world, but evil also threatens and it attacks and it tries to destroy the dignity of the human person. 
In the first reading today, that's what Moses is being taught, reminding the Israelites to teach them um, about their dignity, that they are created in the image and likeness of God, and that has a meaning to it. And that meaning is that we should love our neighbors as ourselves, because when we respect the dignity of others, we are respecting the dignity of our own self. St. Paul will raise that teaching even further because when Christ comes into the world, not only does he restore the fullness of our dignity through his suffering on his cross, but he also, Jesus in his mercy, raises our dignity. And St. Paul teaches that. Because the Holy Spirit dwells within us, we're sacred. Life is sacred. Our dignity is sacred. It's much more than just being created in the image and likeness of God. Now we have God dwelling within us. And that creates a sacredness and, and calls for us to respond to one another and look at each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. When Jesus is offering his teaching today in the gospel story, um, he's talking about how it is that in the face of evil we're to stand. Uh, turning the other cheek is standing with courage and not responding with hatred or vengeance, but rather responding in the face of evil with the tenderness and love that Jesus responded on the cross. One of the temptations, and we'll hear this next week, that Jesus had from the devil in the desert was to call upon the powers of heaven and all the angels to surround him and protect him, lest he dash his foot against a stone. If you think about it, while Jesus is hanging on the cross, he very easily could have said, enough is enough. Angels, it's time to come down and show these people who are doing this to me why it's wrong. But he doesn't do that. Instead, he chooses to respond to his persecutors with tenderness, sweetness, goodness, and love. Even going so far as to say, saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Not only is he praying for them, but he's even giving an excuse on their behalf. They're not, they don't know what they're doing. If they did, they wouldn't be doing this. Jesus is showing us how to act. And he models that as he hangs on the cross. Um, those acts that he does, those virtues that he's showing us, are acts of divine love. And he invites us to be perfect as our Father in heaven is perfect. So how do we do that? We're imperfect creatures. It's impossible for us to be perfect. But it is possible for us to commit acts of divine love. Every time we imitate Jesus, every time we pray for our enemies, every time we give of ourselves in a sacrificial way, we commit an act of divine love because we're imitating Christ, and Christ is perfect. And so we are, in that one singular moment of time, in that one act, we are perfect as our Father in heaven is perfect. And what Jesus is teaching us is that it is this divine love that will conquer and destroy evil. It is divine love that destroys and conquers the evil in our hearts, and it's going to be divine love that's going to destroy and conquer the evil that exists in this world. And so he invites us to be a part of his mission, to go out from this place and commit acts of divine love. And so we gather here together around our Lord's table knowing that what we are going to receive is every tool that's necessary in order to do this. We're going to receive the tenderness of his heart, the goodness of his heart, so that we can share the divine love that we have received here. Let us open our hearts and pray for the gifts and the virtues of Christ to live and reign and to continue to dwell in our hearts so that the divine love of God may continue to grow and be visible in the world.